We're very excited about today. It is one of those moments where I'm reminded of the privilege of working at OSF and how fortunate we are to support desperately needed, timely, relevant, and innovative work. Today's discussion will highlight a current trend in the U.S. racial justice field. We're experiencing right now this moment of transformation, not just with an emergence of new actors, but with the transformation of long-standing civil rights organizations. A lot of these organizations are reinventing themselves with new leadership and with new energy. We'll hear today about one such organization, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, who wrote the traditional mode of the top-down advocacy model to partner with groups on the ground and to respond against instances of hate. Beginning in late 2016, US, the United States witnessed a significant increase in hate incidents. This was a result of an increased toxic environment that was created and perpetuated by a political climate that used people of color, immigrants, and others as targets to motivate and to use fear as a tool to gain power. As a result, there was a rise in incidents at schools, public spaces, homes, in rural America, in our cities. And these, this has affected many communities in a different way. It has challenged our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and safety. So for us right now, this moment raises an important question. What are the remedies? What are the legal tools? What are the ways that we can respond to hate in this moment and have a lasting change and stand up? I'm excited to join today in this discussion with Christy Clark, uh, who is the director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, we're going to explore their work responding to hate through the Stop Hate Project, as well as the development of a hotline, 1-844-9-NO-HATE, which is a resource line for victims of hate incidents. This work is supported through the Open Society Foundation's Communities Against Hate Initiative. The Stop Hate Project works to strengthen the capacity of community leaders, law enforcement, and organizations around the country. It connects groups with established legal services as well as support services, and it develops new resources in response to identified needs. Throughout her career, Kristen Clark has focused on work that seeks to strengthen our democracy by combating discrimination faced by African Americans and other marginalized communities. Clark Firm formerly served as the head of the Civil Rights Bureau for the New York State Attorney General's Office. There, she led broad civil rights enforcement on matters including criminal justice, education, gender inequality, disability rights, reproductive access, and LGBT issues. Under her leadership, the Bureau secured landmark agreements with banks to address unlawful redlining, employers to address barriers to re-entry for people with criminal backgrounds, and police departments on reforms to policies and practices, and major retailers on racial profiling of consumers. In addition, uh, she was able to work on one of the, with one of the largest school districts in the country concerning issues that are dear to my heart, you know, the, um, the, which is the uh, school to prison pipeline. So prior to that, uh, Clark was in the trenches uh, as an attorney for several years at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, another one of our uh, grantees. There she helped lead the organization's work in areas of voting rights and election law. She worked on cases defending the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act, and she worked at the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. While there, she served as a federal prosecutor in the criminal section of the division. She worked on issues such as police misconduct, police brutality, hate crimes, and human trafficking cases. She also worked on voting rights and redistricting cases through the voting, to the, the voting decision. <clears throat> We're also joined today by Becky Monroe, another DOJ alum who is now the director of the Lawyers Committee's new Stop Hate Project. Um, she served as the directing director of Community Relations Service, which is a component of the U.S. Department of Justice. There she, too, worked with law enforcement, government officials, community leaders, and federal agencies to support those who are addressing tension and those who come forward with allegations of discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin. And Becky joined CRS after working as counsel at the Constitution Project, another one of our, our grantees, uh, which is a think tank and advocacy organization where there too she worked with law enforcement, political leaders, and community organizations on immigration and military security issues. Please join us today in welcoming both Kristen and Becky. I actually want 
too, for those that are not as familiar, I want to give Kristen an opportunity to make some uh, opening remarks and also uh, familiarize people with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights on the Wall. Sure. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, Leslie, for that gracious opening and uh, for your leadership and advocacy throughout the years. Um, hate incidents across the United States are surging, uh, devastating individuals and communities across the country. And whether it's our colleagues at the Southern Poverty Law Center who are documenting unprecedented numbers of incidents in communities and schools, or uh, here in New York City, groups that are working to uh, collect data and uh, report on hate, hate incidents, we know that 2016 was a unique year. Indeed, it was uh, the deadliest year for LGBTQ and HIV-affected communities on record. Uh, and we know that hate is terrorizing our country. So we are grateful for the opportunity to partner with OSF to respond to this crisis. Hate incidents and hate crimes threaten the rule of law and the very foundation of our democracy. And the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law was created to help protect these founding ideals. Uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, just by way of background, is one of the country's largest national civil rights organizations. And uh, we were founded in June 21st, on June 21st, 1963. Today is actually our 54th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So we're thrilled to be here to celebrate with you all. Mm -hmm. um, on June 21st, 1963, John F. Kennedy convened a meeting. Um, he issued a call to action to private lawyers across the country. Uh, to mobilize, to do more, um, to help in the civil rights fight. There were about 240 lawyers who heeded his call and attended a meeting at the White House along with him and uh, R.F. Kennedy and other federal officials. And his charge to them was to go back home to their home communities, roll up their sleeves, and figure out how they could use their talents as lawyers to come to the aid of victims of discrimination. Today, the Lawyers Committee operates with the support of a board comprised of 240 lawyers. The number has historical significance. And these are lawyers who stretch from coast to coast across the country and provide critical pro bono support for the work that we do. Uh, what makes us unique vis-a-vis -vis other civil rights organizations is that we do our work shoulder to shoulder with the private bar. Uh, and without their help and support and assistance, uh, we couldn't do the breadth and scope of work that we're able to do. Uh, they truly are uh, the anchor of our organization. The principal mission of the Lawyers Committee is to secure equal justice under law and combat ongoing discrimination faced by African Americans and other racial minorities. We're nonpartisan. Uh, and uh, right now we are leveraging the pro bono support um, from our board to combat <laughs> hate and you'll hear more about the work that's happening on the ground across the country shortly. But we are proud to be a part of Communities Against Hate. Uh, together we are working with diverse leaders from across different communities. We're working with local organizations, philanthropy, and most importantly with law enforcement agencies to combat the scourge of hate and hate-inspired incidents that are now gripping the nation. With national and local partners across the country, we're working to improve the response to hate incidents. Now, our role as a historic organization focused on racial in injustice makes us uniquely positioned to lead this work. Uh, we know that a lot of the hate incidents uh, that we are seeing are targeting communities on the basis of race and other protected statuses. But in addition, we are also a civil rights organization focused on a few other core critical civil rights crises. Uh, we do work to fight voting discrimination and voter suppression. We do work to combat discrimination in housing. We do work to address the need for equal educational opportunity. We work to combat employment discrimination, uh, among other things. But right now, we are using a multidisciplinary approach to understand some of the hate incidents that we are seeing. 
We're seeing hate incidences that are playing out in workplaces. We're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of hate incidents that are playing out in our nation's schools. So we're bringing our deep institutional expertise to bear to understand how best to grapple and respond to the hate incidents uh, that we learn of when they arise. And our contacts in communities across the country to address these issues often include or are connected to the leaders in communities who have been combating hate for generations. We have a lot of uh, existing networks that are helping to facilitate how quickly we learn about hate incidents across the country. By way of example, we run the Election Protection Program, which is the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection effort. That coalition includes more than 100 law firms and over 100 local and state organizations who work with us on voting rights problems, but know that we are a go-to organization that can respond to hate incidents that may arise in the context of their work or in their communities. Just to give you a sense of how critical pro bono support uh, is to the work that we do, last year firms donated over 61,000 hours of legal work uh, to support uh, uh, the battles that we wage at the Lawyers Committee. That uh, 61,000 hours is valued at almost $39 million. So every dollar of support that we receive uh, to support the work that we do is amplified and leveraged by the critical pro bono support that we receive from lawyers across the country who care about this work. We also have a social scientist on staff whose work analyzing data in the voting and housing context has proven invaluable to our litigation and outreach efforts, and whose skills can be used to assess trends uh, that we are seeing with respect to hate incidents and hate crimes. We're also utilizing her skills to build interactive maps that make it easier for people to connect with resources that exist in their communities. So in closing, our work in schools, and our work on housing issues, employment and voting issues, and on criminal justice ensures that our approach to this work respects the profound impact of hate incidents and hate crimes on individuals and on entire communities. And, and this may be a good point to um, turn now to Becky, who will talk about some of the work that's underway across the country right now. Thank you, Kristen. And again, thank you to OSF for all of your support. And certainly thank you to Alvin for, your, for providing this opportunity to us as well. Speak to the mark, please. Thank you. So first, we, we wanted to talk about a little bit about sort of how we think about hate in this context. And one of the things, you know, we put up two definitions here. We have a, a definition of a hate crime and a hate incident. And the reason we put both of those up there is I think most people think, um, you know, they, they may think about a hate crime and think about something that is defined by a criminal statute. So for example, here, it's a, we, we talk about a criminal offense against a person that's motivated by bias. Um, you know, hate incidents are also important for us to recognize and to address. Um, these incidents may not rise to the level of crime, but they're critically important for us to understand. And I think the reason that we talk about hate in this broad way is that it's a, we need to recognize that when, a community, when someone in a community is targeted for hate, uh, it, is, it should not be their responsibility to identify whether or not it violates the code or whether or not they in fact, you know, whether in fact someone could prosecute that crime. Rather, our obligation as, a, as an organization that's working to combat hate is to work with the community to understand how can we do something to address uh, the impact of that hate. Um, I would also say in working with uh, law enforcement, we've also learned that they, they also recognize the importance of looking at hate incidents. So they recognize the importance of, you know, even if something is not yet a hate crime, that kind of information can be important. And so, you know, I would say, we wanted to kind of set that out at the beginning because I think it's important to recognize we want to hear from people, you know, regardless of whether or not it's technically a hate crime or whether it's a hate incident, um, you know, we want to make sure we're hearing from everyone. And I would say, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Communities Against Hate Initiative and, and its unique structure. One of the benefits is that we have these extraordinary partners. Uh, one of our strategic partners is the Southern Poverty Law Center, and, and they also gave us advice as we were setting this up to really think broadly about this 
because they were saying you could miss some really important issues if you try to define too narrowly and put on someone who's targeted for hate the responsibility of defining sort of whether or not they meet some special definition. So when we talk about lawyering to confront hate, um, you know, as Liz was mentioning, one of the things that's important is that we, we really make sure that our lawyering is listening and responding to needs identified by people in the community. Um, you know, as much as we have to recognize there's a surge in hate incidents of hate crimes around the country, we have to also recognize that hate is not new. There are communities around the country that, as we all know too well, are confronting hate for generations and for generations. So to come in and sort of not respect that experience and not respect the, what they already know about their communities, about what's effective, would, would, would be foolish and would, would, would not be an effective way to proceed. Um, so we, you know, we recognize that it's really critical that we re reach out to those local leaders, those local organizations that have been doing this work. And you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've tried to do that and respect the fact that they're also busy doing that work. I mean, I think one of the things is when you think about some of the smaller organizations around the country, they don't have a lot of resources to sit around and think about what, what would be great for us to have. Rather, part of our obligation is to sort of offer them sort of a suite of options and, and hear from them and see if we're sort of providing the kinds of things that they need. Um, I also think it was important for us as we were thinking about this project to think about sustainability. So if we're going into communities, it's critical that when we create resources, we are creating ones that community organizations can use. Because that's how you create sustainability. That's how you kind of make sure that um, you know whatever we're creating can actually have the kind of long-term impact that we want it to have. Um, because I think in the same way that, that hate is not new, we're not going to be able to address this in a very short period of time. We need to give people resources and tools so that they can use them in, 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 in the way that they know best in order to sort of build this movement against hate and, and make sure that it's actually responsive to what people need. So as I mentioned, we are very proud to be a partner in Communities Against Hate, which again is, is a, a, a tremendous coalition that was uh, um, supported by OSF. And it's something that's been fantastic for us is that it gives us a structure in which to work and it gives us access to extraordinary national organizations. So there's uh, 17 national organizations that represent different communities. So we have um, we have the benefit of working with organizations that have expertise in representing Muslim, Sikh, Jewish communities, dis uh, the disability rights community, immigrant rights, racial justice, and LGBT or and organizations as well. And so it's been, um, you know, we thought it was very important and, and really quite a benefit to be a part of this coalition to sort of show what we think works best in communities and what we've seen has worked best in communities, which is when we work together across different communities. So part of the, the sort of strength of Communities Against Hate is that it really does, it's not one, it's not focused on one particular area, it's recognizing that together we can learn from each other and we can develop a better sort of, uh, structure to address hate. Um, we are, uh, you know, the other thing that we really appreciated about this structure is that at the same time we have some structure, we also had flexibility that allowed us to be really responsive to what we were hearing from communities. Um, you have the other, so there's sort of three key pieces. One is a, a piece around documentation, and the Leadership Conference for Civil Rights has been leading that effort and helping to sort of organize and, and work with the 17 other national organizations that are a part of this initiative. Um, and that's been a huge benefit for us to be able to work with the, the Leadership Conference. Um, you know, they have an expertise in bringing together these organizations and making sure that we're working together effectively. So that documentation piece means that there's a communitiesagainsthate.org uh, website where people can go in and they can, if they choose, you know, enter in information about a hate incident that they've ever experienced or that they've witnessed. And, you know, a big part of that, uh, a big goal of that aspect of this initiative is to make sure that we have an accurate public record of hate. I think that, you know, we, I think, we often talk about, and I think it's important to sort of to amplify that we know hate crimes and hate incidents are underreported. Um, we know that for many reasons. For many good reasons, many communities who are targeted for hate don't feel safe reporting. Certainly don't feel safe reporting to law enforcement or to others. Um, we also know that even when they do report, there are times when law enforcement doesn't actually report that to some of the, you know, for example, the FBI that produces some of the um, annual hate crimes data. So it's important to have an accurate public record so people understand what we're, what we're up against and what people need resources uh, to address. The other uh, 
exciting aspect about this is that there's a, a piece where um, OSF has uh, given almost 100 local grantees funding to address these issues. And that's, again, getting back to this uh, really central idea of communities against hate, recognizing that that's where the work happens. And so as a member of this initiative, we have the, this really great opportunity to have access to talk to and learn from these, these grantees. So we, um, we just started that process last week through um, an initial webinar, we're going to be building off of that and sort of trying to develop communities of practice where we can learn what they need from, from us um, and um, you know, and they can learn what kinds of resources we may be able to offer. And perhaps more importantly, they can learn from each other. It's um, as uh, difficult as this work can be in terms of understanding the real cost on, on people when you start to uh, learn about incidents and talk to people who've been affected by hate. Uh, the other side of it is when you see this extraordinary group of people all over the country who are combating hate. And so part of what we also hope to do through our work is to lift that up, because I think that's an important message of hope for the people who are targeted to know that there are people in every part of the country that are combating this and that, that understand the unique harm that is caused by hate incidents and hate crimes. And so finally, you come to the piece with the Lawyers Committee's role, which is to provide resources and follow-up. So, you know, as we mentioned, our, we see our role as strengthening the capacity of community leaders, organizations, local government, and law enforcement to help make sure that people, that, that these different organizations can combat hate by connecting these groups with established local and social resources. I should also note that, you know, in, in order to do this work, we recognize that ideally people have those connections to those groups, but there are either people who are in, in, in places around the country and um, you know, we've, we've talked to several of those people through the hotline who don't have access to those organizations or don't even know that they're there. And so one of the most powerful things we can do is connect them with those groups. Um, but there are also people who we can help directly, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we've tried to do some of that work as well. So um, we have a national stop hate hotline. That is not what our telephone looks like, although that would, you know, I promise we respond much more quickly than that would, would, uh, would appear, but we thought it was a nice looking phone. Um, uh, the hotline is 1-844-9-NO-HATE, and um, it is the first national hotline that serves individuals and organizations that experience hate. And as I mentioned, we really wanted to emphasize that we wanted this to be a resource for organizations as well as individuals. We wanted people to understand, um, you know, again, that we wanted to uh, respect the, the leadership of groups in the community and, and serve as a resource to them as well. We, um, you know, through the hotline, we've been able to connect callers, and, and those are individuals as well as organizations, uh, again, to community organizations, sometimes to social services, and also, in appropriate cases, provide access to counsel as the lawyers committee. Um, one of the things I think it's important to note and to recognize is that it's a new, it's a new resource. So we have to build trust and really have to earn that trust. And so again, we hope that by working with community organizations, we're able to sort of help build, uh, build more of that trust um, by providing those groups with the resources that they need. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, we're really fortunate in that when we have hotline calls, you know, we, we, uh, you know, people, if they call when we're answering it live, we're able to respond very quickly. Um, we also respond to anyone who submitted um, a hate, if they submit a hate incident on the Communities Against Hate website, um, within 24 hours we respond to them if they request any kind of additional follow-up. And um, we're able to do so often more quickly because, for example, uh, last week we had someone who called in with a fair housing issue. So it was an issue around discrimination in housing and, and we could just go down the hall and talk to our colleagues who litigated fair housing cases and ask them, you know, what's your advice about how we should sort of initially address these issues or what, where can we point people to get resources. Um, we have a really tremendous criminal justice project as well and so those resources have been really critical. I think when we talk about um, hate crimes in particular and sort of how do you, um, you know, how do you kind of build the trust necessary to report a hate crime in the community, it's necessary that we grapple with the criminal justice issues and the fact that, um, you know, for many people, justice is not done through the criminal justice system. And so those issues are really important to this work as well. Um, and certainly uh, the education issues. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we uh, we're able to connect people directly with resources because of our experience of our colleagues um, on education issues as well. 
And one just note on, uh, thank you. Uh, one, one note on uh, the hotline is that we have, currently we have English and Spanish capabilities um, in-house, and then we are, uh, through a partnership with the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, we will be able to um, have Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese uh, language access, and we're working with the SIP Coalition to make sure we have Punjabi language access as well. Um, before I give you some examples, I just wanted to give a little bit of sense of what the process looks like when we um, either receive a report, again, online, or for someone who's calling in. Um, we, we also do proactive outreach, so um, you know, we monitor every day what's happening around the country in terms of media reports around hate incidents and hate crimes. We will reach out to community organizations in those communities um, and, and offer our resources, and so you know, we have different ways of receiving input. Um, it, we then sort of conduct an intake call. If the reporter, again, if somebody reported online and they said they were at all open to any kind of follow-up, we'll give them either a call or email, however they prefer to be uh, contacted. And, and it gives us a sense to assess what resources do we have on hand now, what would be most useful. Um, we do um, relatively quick legal research with our internal team if, if necessary, so we'll look at the relevant laws that may be raised by an issue, um, we'll look at existing social resources, we'll also uh, track down additional organizations, we're developing a database uh, in-house that um, you know, it's identifying hundreds of community groups so that if someone calls, we can kind of turn around and give them those resources. Uh, and we also, you know, we'll, we'll provide a, a quick follow-up call and see if we're on the right track in terms of what either the individual organization wanted. Um, and as I mentioned, there are times where a legal response may be appropriate. I should say at the outset, for the vast majority, it may not be something that needs to be dealt with uh, through litigation. Often it, it's uh, other ways that we can help to address these issues. I think that's important to flag. Um, but if there are legal issues, we can, um, and we've done this already with one case that I'll talk about, work with pro bono counsel to make sure that we um, can provide uh, representation they need, or in other cases, uh, work with our partners to identify other uh, organizations that connect people directly with lawyers. Are you taking questions? Um, we are going to take yeah. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll invite people to come up here. So I will, um, uh, I just wanted to give a few concrete examples so you can get a sense when we say, what are the resources you're offering, what it looks like. Okay. Um, uh, you know, we, we have here several images of, of around, that are around issues that we've dealt with. Um, the, the first image you see there from the LA Times, this is about a, uh, a case in Albany, California, which is in Northern California. And there was an Instagram account that was created by a handful of high school students. Um, the postings to the account exclusively targeted students of color and one African-American staff member of the school. Um, the Instagram account actually ended up targeting almost all of the girls of color in the 11th grade. Um, the postings included pictures of nooses around the necks of one African-American student and her coach, um, comparisons of students to animals, uh, a black doll, alongside images of the KKK, a torch, a noose, um, really horrific and virulent pictures that were again targeting um, only the students of color in that, in that high school. Um, a number of students in the school liked or commented on those images. Um, and after learning of the account, the school disciplined the students who were involved with the account. The reason we got involved originally was that one of the mothers called and said, we need, we'd like to understand what kinds of resources are available to the school to address these kinds of issues going forward. Um, and so we connected them with organizations that address issues around discrimination in the school, and we, you know, we, we, went, we, um, we called some of these groups ahead of time, made sure that that would be something that they could be able to offer. But then we got a call um, from, you know, and, and learned that uh, after the discipline, um, some of the boys chose to sue the school, saying that their First Amendment rights were violated by the decision of the school to discipline them. So we uh, worked with one of, the, one of the firms that we work with, we worked with Pro Bono Council, to file an amicus brief in that case. Our amicus brief is expressly focused on the pernicious impact of this kind of hate, especially hate that targets people at the intersection of race and gender. We wanted to talk and we wanted to, we cited there's extensive research about the, 
harm not only to the students who were targeted in terms of physical harm and, 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 um, and mental harm, but also harm to the school community at large. And we wanted to do that because you know, we thought it was important for the court to recognize that if in this context, when you're talking about First Amendment rights, you're often talking about the impact on school. So does it disrupt school activity? And we felt like it was really important for people to understand just how this disrupts school activity, just how this can devastate not only the targets of that discrimination, but really the entire school community. Um, so we filed that, I think now, uh, or we, we sought leave to file that two weeks ago, and we're still waiting to see whether the court will accept it. We filed it in the district court, which is um, you know, a little bit unusual, but we thought that it was important enough to make sure that that was part of the, the narrative. Um, you know, part of this, you should also note, you know, if you looked at the narrative that was in the media, it sort of quickly switched to concern around First Amendment rights for these for these young men, as opposed to sort of recognizing the harm that uh, was done to these young women. Uh, I also, you know, we, we included, I think many of you know, uh, what's been happening in uh, Charlottesville. And so at this picture at the bottom left is of a rally that was held just a few weeks ago. Uh, in Lee Park to, um, it was by you know, groups that were affiliated with Richard Spencer and the alt-right. Uh, we started, you know, we reached out to people in Charlottesville and started hearing a lot of concerns about upcoming activity. There's an upcoming KKK rally on July 8th. There's an upcoming alt-right demonstration in August. Um, there are also people who refer to themselves as flaggers who um, support the Confederate flag, but they've also been sort of talking about holding other separate rallies. So one of the things we wanted to do is to sort of figure out how can we be a resource to the community um, during this time. And so we have reached out. Um, there were some groups that actually asked for help with identifying legal issues around the upcoming protests, figuring out sort of what are ways to address what the supremacists are doing. Are there ways to sort of make sure that we're um, you know, recognizing some of the legal issues around demonstrations, making sure protesters who may choose to have other protests or maybe there are some counter protesters understand what their rights are as well in these contexts. Um, and finally, we put this up here because in Southwest Virginia, um, we also have been partnering with some, uh, with some national unions. It's been national union organizations that have talked about how their members are feeling particularly affected by the increasing plan activity in Southwest Virginia, and that their members are, are, are understandably scared and concerned. And so we're planning to hold a meeting um, probably later in the summer with the union to talk to their members about kind of what their experience has been of the same piece and plan activity. Um, you know, I wanted to include uh, a couple of organizations of, uh, a couple examples of organizations that reached out to us. Legal Services Alabama actually called the hotline and said that they, they knew that the people they were serving, the low income people they were serving were particularly vulnerable to hate incidents and hate crimes, but wanted to make sure they were doing what they could to identify that. So we actually worked with them to tweak some of their intake to sort of figure out how you could get at some of those issues around discrimination, for example, in housing. Uh, and we will be going to Montgomery likely in late July and working with Southern Poverty Law Center and Legal Services Alabama to hold a convening both about sort of the, sort of the Know Your Rights session around hate incidents and hate crimes, but also a separate meeting both with uh, legal services lawyers but also other lawyers who work with low-income clients to talk about sort of what are the kinds of civil remedies that you can seek for people who are targeted for hate, and really think about how we can kind of work together as lawyers to improve uh, our, our approach to those issues. Um, in Portland, we heard just, um, this was just last week, from an organization, uh, a really tremendous immigrant rights organization that's been working um, in coalition with other groups in Portland, and asked us specifically, said, you know, we don't have lawyers on staff, we're trying to sort of understand kind of the legal parameters around a couple of key issues. Could you provide us some guidance? Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around the First Amendment and what it protects and what it doesn't. So they've asked us to sort of provide some of that research for them in, in a user-friendly form. So we're doing that as well. Um, and then finally, um, we have an image that was taken from a, a, a Twitter account. Um, this we learned about. We Actually, through one of our partners, connected us with um, the mother of a student in Virginia. Um, this is about 45 minutes outside of DC. Her son went to high school, um, and it's the same high school as a senior who um, sent this Twitter message to a young woman.
who lives in Texas, um, she, uh, you know, she posted some really beautiful pictures of herself. I thought they kind of looked like senior pictures, maybe, and she um, just put it out into the world. And then he wrote, uh, you can see the, the threat he wrote back to her. Um, the what was interesting is it's, I don't we don't know kind of what the young what the what the man who sent this message to this young woman thought where she was. She actually didn't go to school near him, but all of the Muslim students who did go to his school were obviously quite concerned and, and, and fearful about going to school on the next on Monday with, um, with, with this young man. And so part of what we did was that the mother reached out. She had gone to the school initially. She said that the school had talked about the fact that, the, you know, maybe there wasn't an immediate security threat. But part of what she said is, but my children don't feel safe at school. You, you, when you talk about safety in school, that's not just sort of an immediate security threat. You're talking about you know, the obligation to make sure all students have the ability to go to school free from discrimination and to learn in a safe environment. And so what we were able to do through our colleagues at our uh, a PrEP program, which is a Parental Readiness and Empowerment Program, um, which is a really tremendous program that has, um, its goal is to sort of provide parents with tools to advocate for their children. Uh, we were able to connect her directly with um, the Center for Safe Schools, and they can provide very concrete things that she can sort of take with her when she talks to school administrators. Um, the mother who called us is a pretty extraordinary woman. She kind of, she went, she made the, she, she, she was very consistent. She talked to the principal. She, I think she kind of made the principal an ally in this fight. And so the other sort of great thing about the resources that we're able to connect her with is that those resources can also, if a school requests them, provide them with very specific uh, trainings and the ability to go into the school and offer those trainings. So, um, you know, again, we included this um, partly because I think it's under, important to understand sort of, again, what students are experiencing around the country. Um, but also, it's, it's tremendous to see there are advocates around the country who are going to keep fighting. And if we can just give them a few additional tools, they can do so much more. Um, and I, you know, I just wanted to mention quickly kind of how our outreach approach tries to reflect this recognition. Um, you know, the, the, the communities need different things depending on where you are. So in terms of community engagement, we've been reaching out to specific cities, because again, we recognize that you know, with a new hotline and as we're kind of getting out into the world, we need to sort of reach out directly to people and ask what we need. So we will be, we're working, for example, in Baton Rouge with um, uh, Southern University's uh, law school. We're talking to them about sort of holding a, a, a civil rights symposium um, uh, meeting later in the fall and throughout the summer we're going to be sending out some of the organizers that work with the Lawyers Committee to understand what are the kinds of issues that people want to address, uh, both respect, with respect to hate, but obviously because we'll be in that news, we'll be talking about policing and criminal justice issues as well. Uh, we will be in, um, we've been in Baltimore, thanks to uh, colleagues in our office who have um, pretty tremendous experience in working in Baltimore, so we um, We've been reaching out to local community leaders. We've, been, uh, we've had the opportunity to work with some of the um, city delegates who've brought together community leaders for us to talk to, about to get a better sense of what people are feeling, what they need. Um, we've uh, talked to the Metropolitan Transportation Authority there to talk not only about, you know, hopefully getting some, work, um, some space to sort of share information about the hotline, but also to offer resources to conductors and to other people who work on the MTA, if they recognize hate, if they see hate, what are the kinds of things that they can do? Um, I mentioned we'll be in Montgomery later this summer in Charlottesville. In Philadelphia, we're working with um, at the Arab American Institute, which um, many of you may know um, is a, a national organization, but they have very strong uh, connections in Philadelphia, so we're working with community groups there. Um, one of the exciting things there is that with AAI, we've been able to sort of identify a lot of organizations again from across different communities. So from the LGBT community, immigrant community, Muslims, Sikhs, Jews, we've been able to bring a lot of people together to, um, to both think about sort of how are they all as individual organizations addressing hate? What can they learn from each other? How can they learn what hate looks like to somebody in a different community that they may not be thinking about? And then finally, sort of how um, can we build task forces um, if communities are ready, and some may not be, but where communities are ready and want to build a task force, for example, with the state attorney general, if they feel like that state attorney general is friendly to this, how do you build that kind of capacity? And the importance there and the, the piece there is that 
if you can bring in law enforcement outside of crisis situations, if you can start to build relationships, again, where, where people are ready to build them, because it's, it's, a, it's important to recognize that, um, then people can start to sort of, both sides, um, both law enforcement and, and community can kind of work together a little bit more effectively to prevent hate. Um, we also, I should say, reached out um, to over 180 Title IX and diversity coordinators on college campuses. One of the things we've been seeing and I think we've been reading about is sort of the increase in hate and certainly the increase in white supremacist activity targeting uh, colleges and universities. So we've been reaching out to sort of say, look, these are the kinds of resources we can offer administrators. We want to make sure your students feel supported. Please reach out to us. And we've been having follow-up conversations <coughs> with some of those leaders as well. Um, you know, we are the Lawyers Committee, so we wanted to make sure we were talking to lawyers. And I think as Kristen noted, uh, we feel particularly strongly that lawyers have a special obligation to stand up here to hate. Um, in the same way that as we were founded, um, there was a recognition that whether you're in the private bar or working in public interest, as a lawyer, you have an obligation to, to really stand up for justice. So we are, we've created CLE trainings and we'll be rolling them out in different cities and uh, around the country. Uh, often with partners, um, both nonprofit partners as well as firm partners. Those trainings will offer people uh, information about uh, kind of an overview of federal hate crimes and state hate crimes, but also talk about what are civil remedies people can pursue. Um, you know, the other key piece that we really wanted to include in that is that every CLE training will highlight two to three local community organizations that are already combating hate. And so whether or not they need additional support or no, we just wanted to make sure that we were um, connecting people with those resources and that letting people know that there's a lot of people already doing this work in your community and they need your support. Uh, and you know, we, we're also sort of partnering with a lot of organizations to, to close some resource gaps. So just to give a quick summary of some of the things that we are providing, and um, we actually have a, a website that has, hosts a lot of these uh, resources. We're, we have user-friendly state summaries of hate crime statutes. So those are federal statutes as well as um, uh, the state statutes for that particular state. Um, they answer questions that we're hearing a lot about. I've had property damage. What, what can I do? You know, people have targeted me with graffiti. What are the things that I can do to sort of recover from that? Um, we, uh, so that's accessible on the website. Um, we've developed resources for college campuses. We have sort of door hangers for dorm rooms about sort of what can you do if you're targeted for hate. Um, we've developed palm cards. Um, we're working with Black Youth Boats, which is uh, part of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. And they're looking at developing training resources for HBCUs and also thinking about H how HBCUs could work with PWIs or predominantly white institutions to support students of color on those campuses. Um, we have an interactive resource map, which again is something we're trying to promote just to give, not only to, so people can see what's in their community and what's available and what resources are there, but also um, to send the message that there are a lot of groups around the country that are doing this work. Uh, we are also developing toolkits for communities and schools and prosecutors about when hate comes to town, how do you combat that. I also want to note there's a lot of really amazing groups out there that have already done that work, so we are make sure where, where they have done that, we're just connecting with them and promoting those. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're at the state where we need template letters now for when the KKK is leafleting, so we have a template letter on our website so that you can reach out to local law enforcement if you have concerns around uh, KKK leafleting. Um, we also have a letter around fly alerts, which is sort of making sure all students uh, regardless of immigration status, have access to schools. Um, in conjunction with some of our affiliates, the Lawyers Committee, including the Boston Lawyers Committee, we're having, we have some Know Your Rights materials that we're pulling together for trainings. Um, the Chicago Lawyers Committee has been doing an accompaniment program for some time, where they help support people who are going through, if there is a hate crime uh, case, they help them through that process, and then they often represent them in the civil matter because uh, Chicago or, or Illinois has some state statutes that provide civil remedies. Um, we're uh, developing information specifically for immigrants around hate crimes. We're working uh, with IUDA, which is a local organization in Washington, D.C., um, and just recognizing, of course, the, the unique um, sort of challenges and fear and how, you know, when you when you think about what immigrants are confronting right now, if they are targeted for hate, sort of what are the different things, what are concrete resources we can offer, what are options for them, and making sure that we're providing that in a way that respects people's 
um, needs right now. So in other words, we're not having huge know your rights sessions if people don't feel comfortable coming to those. Um, we're trying to figure out kind of how to do that most effectively. Um, and finally, we're working, um, we're working with colleagues in law enforcement leadership organizations, including the International Association of Chiefs of Police, to talk about how do you improve law enforcement response to hate crimes. And again, that's a long path, and I think we recognize that. For many communities, that's something that's going to take a long time, but we think it's important that we start that conversation. And finally, just to give you a sense of things that are coming, um, many thanks to um, all of my colleagues at the Stop Hate Project, and particularly Nadia, Nadia Aziz, who's here. Uh, um, we were able to pull together the content, some much of the content I was just talking about, and it's on the website www.8449nohate.org. Um, we also, uh, you know, one area we need to work and we know we need to build on is a public education campaign. It's both about the resources we offer, but also just helping people understand what, what are hate crimes, what are hate incidents. I think, you know, one of the things you hear a lot in this space is that this hate has become normalized. And I think um, that's something that we can't accept. Uh, but one of the, the consequences is that people sort of just get used to some of this and they don't think that it's something that's worth reporting. And so, um, you know, it's, it's again understandable when people aren't getting the kind of response that they need. But that's part of the, part of, you know, what we'd like to do going forward is do a little bit better with that. Um, and then think about other partnerships with MTAs or other places we can get sort of the word out about resources and about hate crimes uh, to the public. Uh, and again, for all of these things, we want to recognize, you know, there are other groups that have been doing this great work. We've been seeing it some, in some ways, and I think that's great. As long as somehow the word is getting out about what these issues are, um, you know, then that's, that makes a difference. Um, we would just love to find ways to get more words about the resources that are available to people as well. Um, we just wanted to give you contact information. You know, we are, um, yeah, we have a presence on both Twitter and Facebook and trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, but I just really want to thank you and really, we, we, I feel so fortunate that we have this opportunity to do this work, um, and particularly in this, um, in this context with so many tremendous organizations. And uh, thanks everybody for your interest in the work. Thank you. We are going to move to question and answer, and so this is how we are going to do it. We, for those who are able, we're going to ask that you come up to the podium and form a line for question and answer, and we'll actually uh, try to work with our support folks here for those who would like to ask a question but are not able to find a way for you to be able to ask questions. Um, while people decide or formulate what their questions are, um, and I'd like to ask an opening question, I'm going to take the privilege of doing that. Um, one of the things you mentioned was law enforcement. Um, and this work is really, really difficult to get right um, in the Devon. And uh, you've got a lot of different groups and people who maybe don't normally work with one another. Um, there's a trust deficit there. Um, and I'm wondering what role the, the both of you have pre existing relationships with prosecutors, with law enforcement, as well as with impacted communities. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the importance of having pre-existing relationships at the center of all of these communities to the work that you're doing right now? Yeah. Let me um, start, and then I'll ask Becky to fill in the gaps. I, I think that it's really important and critical that we try and engage unusual allies in doing this work. And I'm very proud of the dialogue that we've started to open up with the international Association of Chiefs of Police. I think when we look across the landscape across the country, and I know this from a prior work that I did as a federal prosecutor at the Justice Department handling hate crimes, is that it's a very spotty landscape. Um, in New York City, uh, inside the police department and the DA's office, there is some expertise and political will to deal with the unique problems that exist in the hate crime space, but you don't see that in a lot of parts of the country. Um, as a result, you have matters that arise that are not investigated properly, data collection problems, and a whole morass of issues. So we're very excited about this dialogue that's now open. And, but it is interesting, Leslie, right, to think about um, the trust gap, right? Uh, there, I think it's fair to say many minority communities and communities of color um, that feel that it's difficult 
uh, to forge a working relationship with law enforcement. There's strains there. Some of that stems from uh, the police misconduct and excessive use of force problems that exist out in the universe. So I think we're approaching that very sensitive and aware to those tensions, but with a real recognition and awareness that there are a lot of possibilities that open up if we can get law enforcement to the table, seize on the political will that might be there, and raise the level of consciousness about, um, about hate crimes and why they must be uh, tackled and, and addressed more, more effectively. I think that's right, and I think, Leslie, you hit on, I mean, it's, um, you know, even when I was talking about it earlier, I think it's it's hard to talk about sort of the importance of working with law enforcement and for so many communities, law enforcement yeah. does not feel safe, and we recognize that. I think part of the reason we felt like it was important to do this work and, and some of the work that I did at DOJ um, uh, reflected this was that we, you know, I, I, I can remember, for example, going into a city um, in the aftermath of uh, the murder of a transgender woman. And it ended up not being prosecuted as a hate crime. But the reality was in that community, transgender women were terrified. It didn't matter whether or not they called it a hate crime or whatever they called it, they were still terrified. And we worked with law enforcement sort of to make sure, uh, one, that they were recognizing that these issues were happening, two, that they were aware of the fact that whether or not it fit the definition, it still terrorized the community and, and, it, and still lost someone they loved. And sort of how do you kind of build those connections with law enforcement outside the, the context of a crisis situation? Um, and so, you know, we, in, in some of those contexts, uh, it was working with chiefs who were open to recognizing that they didn't have those relationships in the community and talking about how do you start to build those. You recognize that you, you try to work with community organizations and community leaders, that they can sometimes be a bridge with the community. They may feel more comfortable in those initial conversations. And so, for example, in the case I'm thinking about, the chief there ended up sort of bringing in um, someone from the, one of the sort of transgender grassroots organizations as a part of his sort of regular quarterly meeting um, with, with different leaders in the community so that he started to develop that relationship. He started to hear on a regular basis what their experience with law enforcement was. And it wasn't only talking about hate incidents, it was a talking about sort of concerns they had um, you know, as, as victims of harassment you know, often in, in the hands of law enforcement. So how do you build those relationships? And so, I think it's just, it's a difficult path that I also know, um, you know, that we, you know, we wanted to pursue this because we know that at the end of the day, um, there has to be a recognition of a, of a common goal to keep communities safe, and that that can only happen if people are treated with respect and, and, and if, um, you know, the community can also hear about sort of how law enforcement prosecutes these cases, how does law enforcement investigate these cases, um, you know, and also more importantly, the law enforcement can hear from the community about sort of what are the issues they're seeing on a daily basis, what's happening, and, and the goal there is, you know, ideally you try and develop that in a non-crisis situation so that when crises do happen, you know, people feel comfortable going forward. But there's no question as we proceed with that, we're proceeding with great sensitivity and caution to the, with respect to the fact that people um, in many communities for many reasons and many good reasons don't feel that kind of safety. So now we're going to take a moment to take questions. And I say questions, there's got to be a question in there. Um, and I'd ask everybody before you ask a question, briefly state your name to introduce yourself. And if folks are ready, we're going to start with the first question. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing this together. It's very informative. Um, my name is Yolanda Merchant, and I'm actually an art curator and have lived around the world. So. Um, have lived with a lot of different cultures, including uh, Chinese and, and in the Middle East. Um, <clears throat> one of the things um, that is somewhat addressed by what you're saying, that I think, in my opinion, should be addressed more strongly, is creating you know, an educational program in the elementary schools and the middle schools um, that sort of detox children. So by the time you get to the adult level and you're reporting your crime, you know, their opinions are pretty much set in stone and it's very hard, not possible to undo that. So I'm just saying, um, I mean, I don't, with this administration, I don't know that anything like this would be enforced on a national level, but 
I think having it be mandatory with school funding, that there be a school program to, to address uh, children and how they think. Because it's not just against, I'm Cuban born, it's not just against blacks or Latinos. Um, I mean, you can work on Wall Street. My son works for the mayor. My son-in-law works on Wall Street. He can't fathom why anybody would want to work for the mayor for half the salary. Um, so there's a bias there because his whole view is if you don't have money, you're not worth talking to. So, you know, that's, that's what I would say is a program. There is a, when I worked for the mayor in Southampton, there's a program called the Exchange for Li International Living in Brattleboro. And they specifically bring in people before they go work for corporations around the world to change their perspective so that they can address the communities better. And I actually had a representative come down to Southampton to talk to the police department, to talk to the high school, because there was so much friction with the Latin community coming in. And, you know, you're really talking about changing people's minds. And it isn't just addressing them or slapping them on the wrist. That'll never do it. Um, and I think, you know, education, both at the, you know, primary school level, and also bringing in programs like that to address police forces rather than just reprimanding them. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, I think it's a really great point, an important point. We know that the lion's share of hate incidents are sadly playing out inside schools and that um, the spike in hate is having a tremendous impact on young people. Uh, which I think is incredibly unfortunate. Let me just say one thing about um, the work that we laid out during the presentation. This is all work truly built over the first few months of 2017. Um, we talked a little bit about the amicus brief that we filed that seeks to address this whole problem of speech. How do you strike a balance between free speech and addressing some of the hateful speech that we're seeing directed at students of color. Uh, we talked some about some of the outreach that we're doing to school administrators, but I think that you're right, that education at the earliest levels that encourages um, an environment of inclusion and respecting difference is incredibly important. You know, I think you're absolutely right, and I think one of the things we've been trying to do too is identify, as you mentioned, there are some really great programs out there. Southern Poverty Law Center has programs, ADL has programs, um, I think SIC Coalition has programs, so there are some programs out there that could be used in schools, and so one of the things we try to do when we have the opportunity to connect is to sort of make sure that people are aware of those and that the benefit both to the students who are targeted but really to the whole school environment. So I think you're absolutely right, it's an area we need to go, and I think it's um, you know, it's sort of like the mother I was talking about before, who's, um, you know, whose son is Muslim and was feeling really threatened in that school. And it's that every child, and then there's actually, you know, under Title VI and under Title IX, um, you know, there, there are federal laws that, that make this mandatory that everyone has to have that sort of feel comfortable and safe in going to school. And so I think you're absolutely right. It's an area we want to continue to build on. In the, and currently we often do refer people to those other programs that are already in existence. Um, because they have seen results in the but, You know, one thing that's sad. Can I actually just just for Ed, want to provide you, you have a, a follow up question. Um, so if we could do a follow up question and then we're going to go to the next person. Thank you. I want to make sure you have a chance to ask your follow up question. Okay. No, I, all I'm saying is, unfortunately, Soros is not trusted and not really despised within the communities that probably need to make the most changes. So, I mean, I don't know. It's sort of like. You, if you encourage this open-mindedness and this generosity in the school system, are these kids just going to get, you know, bumped aside because of those, you know, the society isn't built against, uh, you know, on that philosophy. So I mean, it's it's much bigger than just the schools. It's the whole society's focus on encouraging dog eat dog. Excellent point. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gordon Skinner. Uh, in another life, I was an international dispute mediator. Uh, speak up. Speak up. So, as I was saying, uh, 
in that other aspect of doing international dispute mediation, I recognize the importance of uh, making sure that all stakeholders were present. And unfortunately, what that means is those individuals who are actually perpetrating these wanton acts of violence and hate because they are in those communities and it is not enough to just quell them or suppress them or adjudicate them, but to figure out a way how to address this on a systemic basis. Uh, and with that, I wanted to know if there were things there, if there were points of connection. I also wanted to throw out that it is a, a concern to me personally that as the demographics change with respect to race, so will those attitudes, but the attitudes now might shift into one who had been perpetrated against with such violence and feels empowered to start carrying out these similar types of violence that they've experienced over the generations. Mm. So I think that those are you know, areas to, to explore you know, because we have to have the courage of our conviction. So I wanted to know if those are things that you were looking at. And a follow-up with regard to organizations that are addressing, that are working in the schools. There's an organization called Border Crossers that actually teaches teachers how to have conversations about institutionalized racism in their classrooms. And that, you know, and this is on a grade school level. The importance there is the shift that occurs starting with adolescence. Uh, by example, the, the, the violence in Northern Ireland stopped because eight-year-old girls said to their fathers, I don't want that which I'm about to inherit. What are you doing to change that reality? So that's the importance of effect of addressing and empowering youth at a very early level to start having these very critical conversations. And so I wanted to just throw that out to you and see if there were, was there, if it was any resonance whatsoever. Thank you. So let me um, just start off by observing the commonalities between both of those first questions. A real recognition of um, the pervasiveness of this problem when we're talking about young people, and that is not lost on us. I think uh, it's important to recognize the environment that we're in. I think, unfortunately, we don't have a U.S. Department of Education that's going to be out there aggressively uh, championing reform uh, on these issues. And we recognize that, and we are trying to step in to fill the gap. And we are thinking about how to activate State Department of Educations and local Department of Educations to recognize how they may uh, be able to uh, step in and fill some of the voids and thinking about what are the resources that we can arm them with to uh, fill in some of the gaps that we are seeing now and can continue to expect over the next few years when we don't have a strong Department of Education uh, working to respond to this crisis. I, I, I just, I mean, I, the only thing I would add is that I think it, you know, it definitely resonated with what you were saying in part, the, the piece about sort of, we can't sort of litigate our ways out of, out of this, this the, uh, going through the sort of criminal justice system is not necessarily the only way we're gonna address this, and it's not the way we're gonna resolve this. And so I think a lot of our work, especially with young people, has to recognize sort of where this is coming from, addressing it early as you were talking about, um, and just sort of uh, the recognition that um, this is gonna take, it really is going to take an entire culture shift, but in order to start that, we have to start understanding sort of what's driving hate, especially you know as we see it in, in young people. I mean, I will say you know, the number of, number of issues we're seeing in schools suggests that um, although demographics are changing, we still are seeing this increase in hate. So we need to sort of figure that piece out, and that's something that we, you know, we're looking forward to working with a lot of partners to try and do. So I'm mindful of the time, and I want to make sure that everybody who is in the queue gets a chance to ask their question. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask to staff the question. So the three individuals that would like to ask questions, please come up, identify yourself, ask your question, and then we'll answer all of them in one final round. Um, hi, my name is Lindsay, and I work for the Tandem Bound Center for Interreligious Understanding. Um, we combat religiously motivated hate, uh, violence, prejudice um, in schools, workplaces, healthcare centers. Um, my question is, and we have a few other programs internationally, but I'll stop there. 
Um, my question is something we talk about probably more from a philosophical and media point of view, but I'm also curious from a legal point of view, is where does a hate crime end and terrorism start? Because you mentioned the transgender, that one case of a hate crime, but it terrorizes the community. And so I wanted to put that out there. Great question. Hi, uh, my name is Adam. I'm with Human Rights First. I'm a foreign policy research fellow there, but I work on uh, combating anti-extremism and uh, anti-Semitism and extremism online especially. And two of the incidents, as you mentioned, happened on social media. Uh, there's Instagram and Twitter. And obviously, social media gives people on the fringes a much larger voice, and it creates some impunity for hate speech. And this is especially true. Uh, to the two incidents you mentioned, mentioned were also the younger generation. Uh, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the actual social media companies. Uh, what What is the onus on them in terms of engaging and combating hate speech? And have you been working or partnered with social media companies at all? And uh, I apologize, I know it's an open-ended Question, but I'd like to hear your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew. I'm a writer of software to combat extremism online. So, sort of echoing his question, what is the trade off? In what are the sort of, what is the legal background to combating not necessarily violent rhetoric? but demonizing rhetoric, dehumanizing rhetoric online, etc. And say social media networks, the few dozen of them that might have influence, say they don't agree to self-censor. What is the sort of legal possibilities there? For example, there's a, I have a database of extremists that I follow, grab mm -hmm. comments, whatever. One of the fellows on the top, he came of a month or two ago, I think, and stabbed someone in New York, right? And this is after being fed sort of dozens of videos and blog posts with the dehumanizing and demonizing rhetoric. So what are the possibilities there? Thank you. I'm gonna, these are, these are really many questions that were asked at the end there, and I'm gonna make, uh, try to make an attempt here to sort of summarize a bit, uh, give folks a moment to gather their thoughts. Um, one was the role of uh, free speech and our social media partners in this effort, um, and the limitations that you see there. The other is, I think goes back to where we started, which is how do you define hate, and what does hate become terrorism? Um, and a conversation about the way we define domestic terrorism, or do not define domestic terrorism, depending on who the victims are. So. Yeah. Turn those very easy questions over to you. Yeah. So, um, briefly, there is a federal law um, that some may be aware of called the Communications Decency Act, which immunizes online publishers from liability for content posted by third parties. But this has proven to be a real obstacle in um, combating some of the hate that we've seen proliferating um, online and in social media. That said, um, we're going to preview action for you that we're taking today um, to try and respond to um, some of the hate that we're seeing uh, spread online. So I think, as you know, as Kristen mentioned, there are some some restraints. But one of the things we've also been thinking about is um, really approaching this in two ways. One, we know many of our colleagues, for example, Southern Poverty Law Center, other organizations have been reaching out to some of the platforms to see if they would you know, voluntarily talk about sort of how can we address these issues and recognize common interests there. So that's something that we'll continue to move forward. Uh, but we're also recognizing that um, you know, for many, for example, uh, website hosts, they have um, uh, agreements around sort of uh, community user agreements, for example, that, and they have sort of rules that they set themselves as, as, um, as website providers or as hosts and so one of the things we are doing is sort of looking at all of those community user agreements and where those user agreements say that they prohibit sort of discrimination or uh, you know, racism. There, there are, they, they have the ability to do that as private companies. 
Um, we're going through, and this is not necessarily legal action, but what we're going through is pointing out, look, this is what your user agreement says, and look, you host this uh, racist website that actually violates um, you know, your own terms of your agreement. Let's think about sort of, you know, it, it seems like we want to bring that to your attention and know that you, you know, they're, they're violating your terms and therefore you should stop hosting them. One of the things we recognize is that's a little bit of um, kind of whack-a-mole a little bit, because then they'll move to another one. So then the question is, is there some way we could work together to sort of, you know, get a process out that says, this is how you figure out who's hosting it, this is how you figure out what their agreement is, and sort of get that out into the world where people who are also committed to doing this can do it in a relatively easy way. So, you know, we're, we're starting that process. Um, actually, tomorrow we're sending a letter to one of the hosts that we found that uh, hosts a particularly virulent uh, racist website. And again, their own terms of agreement say that they, they don't permit that, so we're gonna start there, but try and figure out how we sort of make this broader in an effort that we can almost sort of crowdsource so that others could do it as well. So Kristen, I'm gonna give you the last word here as we sort of talk about what we define as hate, um, depending on who the victim is. I think um, how this is part of a larger campaign um, to highlight that, uh, the resources and the evolution, uh, as well as what you think um, should be defined in this category, and when does it cross the line between hate and terrorism? Um, you know, particularly some of the, the violent acts, uh, you know, what we saw here in New York City, uh, where a white man traveled from Baltimore with the intent of targeting African American males. I mean, these are indeed acts of domestic terrorism, and we've been encouraging that we shift the narrative and begin to talk about um, some of these particularly violent incidents in that way. Um, Leslie, we are really pleased to be in a position where we can uh, step up and respond to this crisis that we see gripping the nation. I think the feeling is, sadly, that you know, while, while we are responding, and there's all hands on deck, and we're leveraging pro bono support to try and attack hate, I think there is a feeling that sadly hate is something we're going to be living with for some time. I think we, we feel the weight of a Justice Department that is scaling back. We feel the weight of the Justice Department's silence. Uh, and, you know, when some of these hate incidents have happened, I think there is a, a, a void, a feeling in communities that you want someone out there who recognizes. Uh, maybe not go so far as to condemn before a full investigation has played out, but recognizes you know, some of these acts of terrorism that are playing out in communities. So we're stepping up to be the people's justice and uh, really trying to do all that we can through both litigation and advocacy and public education and training and engaging with unusual allies to respond to what we deem to be a, a crisis. And we're doing that at a moment where we really are stretching because this is not the only problem that we're living with. Uh, voter suppression, rolling back a lot of the progress that has been made on the criminal justice reform front, still pushing forward to deal with some of the education problems that nag the nation remain priorities for us. Uh, so we look forward to continued engagement with you, Leslie. We thank you for uh, your leadership and Alvin Stark's leadership and look forward to working with many of the folks in this room to continue to respond in the most aggressive way that we can to respond to the hate, crisis, hate crime crisis gripping the nation. Thank you so much. And actually, I, I'm, I'm so very glad that we had a chance to be here. I'm glad everyone here showed up. Um, that really just shows the tremendous interest here. I do actually want to give a special thank you to Alvin Starks, who has really been the driving force um, behind this work, along with our partners, Nancy Human, who I see in the audience, and I think Amar was here a moment ago. But I really want to thank everybody who helped put this work together, and everybody for the interest here today. So thanks so much.